Hello, welcome to Women in the Word. So good to see everyone and be here. I'm Lynn Kitchens. I'm happy to get to talk about Jesus, how much he loves us. I'm so glad. Isn't it great to do that with groups of women? It's awesome. Okay, so are you ready to be transparent this morning? Let's just be transparent. Okay, so I want to talk about spiritual misconceptions today, and I want to know what some of yours might have been before you knew Christ, or even as a young believer, and I have my list, and I'm going to see if you had some of these same spiritual misconceptions, so wherever you're watching this lecture, just be ready to raise your hands. Okay, when I was a young girl, I thought if you lived in America, you were a Christian. Was I the only weird one that thought that? Okay, a few thought that, okay. How about if you went to church, you were automatically a Christian? Okay, pretty many. Uh, did you think Christianity was more about what you couldn't do than what you could do? That's the most, <laughs> that is so sad. Okay, uh, how about if you tried to be good, you could get to heaven? How about if you didn't stay good, you could lose your salvation? Wow, and aren't you so glad those were misconceptions? Yay, we have such a bigger God than we can dream up in our own little brains. When Jesus stepped into our world, he was surrounded by people who had misconceptions about who God is and what he desired from them. And they were astonished at the things Jesus said that pushed back against these beliefs. You know, and I know, the kingdom of heaven has very different values than the kingdom of man. But until we meet Jesus face to face, we live in both kingdoms. So we have to work hard to remember to not lose sight of the divine calling that we have and the attitudes and the actions that God desires from us. So staying in God's word keeps us astonished of who he is, what he's done for us what he expects from us. God's word exposes our misconceptions, sets us on a path of truth. You know, it made me think about my wonderful father. Um, he was in his 70s when I kind of challenged him to read the New Testament. He'd never opened the Bible. And it was so fun when he was done to say, I learned a lot of things that, that surprised me about me and about the world and about the church. And so God's word puts us on the right path. So I want to get on that path, beginning with Jesus' view on submitting to government. So how are we to handle government and the taxes that it demands? Some Christians today might say, we don't give in to these demands. Some Christians say, God is our king, and so the government has no authority over me. But Jesus would disagree. Let's look at chapter 17, verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when Peter came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From who do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, Go to the sea, cast a hook, take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Okay, this is a crazy scene, but I want us to even think other things about it. Jesus had just recently, we saw last week, left the mountains of Caesarea Philippi, where he had gone with Peter and James and John, and he had been transfigured in brilliance, in light. His face, they said, shone like the sun right before these three disciples. And they see Jesus speaking in this state to Moses and Elijah. And then out of the heavens come a, a voice of God himself testifying, this is my son. Listen to him. It was so terrifying that Peter, James, and John fell on the ground with their faces in the ground. 
Now this same recently transfigured Jesus returns to Capernaum, and the tax collectors were looking to collect taxes from him. Is, is that not just amazing to think about? If anybody was not responsible to pay earthly taxes, it was Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, the king of the earth, and the king of the Jews. But we see in these verses that he submits to the ruling earthly authority. Why? I read something that I thought was great. This person said, this is the great wonder of Christ and the great wonder of Christians. That while we have the consciousness of glory, and we ought to pass through this world as sons of glory. For this very reason, the Lord calls us to be the humblest and the meekest. And we learn that from looking at his life. The temple of Jerusalem was the center of Jew Jewish worship. You can imagine the cost of maintaining the temple. It was an unbelievable place. So a temple tax got its origin from the time when Israel had left Egypt and was journeying in the wilderness many years earlier. God had given them a command about their worship place at that time, which was the tent of meeting. This is where God's presence dwelled. So look on your verse sheet at Exodus 30, what God told them. Everyone who's numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than the half shekel. When you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting. So in accordance with Moses' instructions, a tax was levied upon the Jewish males for the temple upkeep. A half shekel or two drachmas were equal to two days wages. So in this story, we see Jesus humbly submitting to the Jewish tradition. And I love that because I really think in that moment we can see that Jesus was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. And he was not unresponsive to the demands Israel laid on him, even though he was their king. So the tax collector finds one of his disciples, Peter, and grabs him and says, is your master going to pay taxes or not? And Peter says, yeah, sure he will. Then he goes in to find out. <laughs> As he enters the house, which was probably Matthew's house, Jesus opens the discussion even before Peter can. And it's a discussion about the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus says, just as an earthly king and his sons don't pay taxes under their authority, that Jesus, he says, I am not responsible, nor my sons, the followers, are obligated to pay the tax because I am the king of the earth, is what he's getting Peter to understand. Also, in Jesus' spiritual community, we are the temple of the living God. This temple supersedes the Jerusalem temple. In the kingdom of God, it's about grace, and grace is greater than the law. But since the Jewish leadership, they were functioning in accordance with their rituals and their laws and their rules, they were blind to this truth, and so Jesus would not offend those who didn't understand that following him meant a break from the temple. He was soon going to usher in the church, which would be, unlike the temple, a place of great grace. So meanwhile, how's a Christian today to respond to governing authorities? Well, until we get to God's kingdom, where Jesus will be enthroned eternally, we are here on earth. So he has set up governments to bring peace and justice in the world. Look at Romans 13. This tells us what to do. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending 
to this very thing. So Jesus says, in order to get the money to pay the tax, he tells Peter to do something Peter loves to do, go out and fish. And the first fish you catch, when you pull it in, you're going to find a coin in its mouth and then take that, that shekel, and pay both of our taxes. One whole shekel would pay for two people. Peter obeys. And I believe he was astounded astonished at this divine catch. Think how many fish Peter had caught in his life. Never had one of them had a coin in his mouth. <laughs> Jesus is God. And I know that had to be inside Peter's heart at that moment. Who could know this? Who could do this? But here's something else we can learn. The moment Peter reaches into the mouth of that fish and puts his fingers on that coin two important spiritual realities take place. First of all, Peter is obeying God by submitting to the laws that govern while at the same time trusting Christ alone to meet his needs. He's not putting his hope in his government to meet all of our needs. We put our hope in the one who created the government. We put our hope in Christ he is the one who will provide. So as God's children, we submit to his institutions, but we rely on God's provision. Okay, another misconception had to do with true greatness. So how do we today decide what makes someone truly great? Some people would say, well, we look at their accomplishments, we look at their positions, we look at their successes, we look at them financially, Jesus would disagree. Chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we know that the disciples thought, okay, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. We're all going to have important parts in it. I wonder what great positions he's going to give us. Let's just ask him. How great will we be? Jesus surprises them and takes a nearby child who's probably just walking down to the lake to fish, sets him in the middle of all of them and says, Unless one becomes like a child, he won't even be in the kingdom of heaven. What? Astonished. They didn't really care about children. They didn't esteem them. In Jewish law, they had not one right of their own. They weren't valued. We can see this in the next chapter. Look over at 1913. Children were brought to Jesus that he might lay his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me, don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on the children and went away. So now again he has his hands on a child. He's speaking about the greatness of God's kingdom. And they're using this wonderful child as a visual aid. Jesus says, this is who will be in the kingdom. Someone who's helpless, innocent. Someone who has this simple, trusting dependence. Someone like a child. And again, for Jesus to set this child in the middle of a group of men who are jockeying for prestigious positions in the kingdom of God, and they see Jesus hands on a child who they would have considered a nuisance, saying, here is your greatness, would have been a lesson they well needed to learn. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven isn't based on great works, but on great childlike humility. And God's kingdom, the lowliest, the inconspicuous subject who's faithful to the king, has an infinite worth. You know, the disciples asked the wrong question about the kingdom of heaven. They should have been concerned about how they were going to serve Christ in this kingdom, not how great they were going to be in it. Look at John 12. 
Jesus said, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So as members of God's kingdom, we seek what's great to God, not what's great to man. So he's using this child to illustrate the humble in his kingdom, and now he goes into another misconception, and that's about tempting a child to sin. But we have to ask ourselves, does he mean children themselves here or the childlike believer that, the, that God is trying to have, Jesus is trying to have this child represent? So the Jews use the word child in a double sense, once for children and also for a teacher's disciple. So some commentators say these next few verses about a child. Some say it's about a child of the faith, a young believer. So I say, let's apply both in this situation. Both kinds of little ones is what you'll see. And I think that can mean little ones can mean little believers, young in the faith, easily influenced, vulnerable, and immature. Look at 18 verse 5. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever caused one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. It's necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot cause you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Jesus condemns the way that the fallen world puts stumbling blocks of temptation, but he takes an even sterner stand for the believer who tempts a brother to sin. And some of these so-called believers would not have been believers at all. And I think Jesus also may have had the Pharisees and Sadducees in mind here of the stumbling blocks they put in people's way that are trying to get to God. The stronger person who tempts the weaker person to sin will incur great judgment from their Father in heaven. Why? Because God loves the little ones. He even gives a list describing this love. Look at verse 18. I mean, sorry, 10. See that you don't despise one of these little ones. I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who's in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them's gone astray, doesn't he leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it, more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it's not the will of my Father who's in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Here's his list of the love of God for the little ones. Verse 11, the angels have direct access to the king and are permanent objects of his love. This could mean children have a special group of angelic beings assigned to them. Or just that believers in general are served by angels and they seek God's face to get his commands on how they can help the needy believer. Verse 12, it says, The father seeks his strained children like a shepherd seeks one lost lamb, and then he rejoices when he rescues them. Verse 14, God's love is so deep that he wills that none of the little ones would ever perish. And perish here means spiritual devastation. But look at verse 10. Unlike God, the tempter despises the tempted. The ones that God loves. To tempt those that believe in Jesus is to despise those for whom he loved and he died. God's little ones are loved. And the tempters, by their temptations, mock and make light of the love of God and can shake the little one's confidence in God. 
I read about a very old man who was dying. He was very troubled. And so his neighbors asked him, why are you so troubled? And he told them that as a young boy, he went to this major crossroads and he took the signpost and he turned it in the opposite direction. And then he said, I've wondered my whole life how many people I've sent in the wrong direction. Those who tempt others are leading them in a wrong direction. And for many, it's a path that they stay on for the rest of their lives. And so Jesus said, better to take that tempter and tie a millstone around his neck and throw him into the deepest sea. Now, a millstone was something they used to crush corn, the Jewish people did. There was a top big stone, but it had a handle on it, so a woman could turn it to crush corn. But underneath was the millstone. It was so big that only a donkey could turn it. So Jesus is making a point of the severity of leading others away from him. But then he also talked, what's our responsibility regarding these temptations? It's just as severe. Jesus tells the seriousness of giving into temptation, and we just read he uses a hyperbole, telling us, cut off your body parts that cause you to sin. Or you can experience great fiery judgment. What he meant was, it would be better to do life without a part of your body than to bear the consequences of your sin. So severe self-discipline is required to remove whatever is offensive to our king. To keep from offending God, we often have to make radical changes in our lives. Yours may be different than mine. Different things tempt me maybe than they do you. But you know what they are. The things we see, the people we're with, the things we do that push against God's word. Radical changes have to often take place. And in these verses, those who habitually sin, they may not really know the Lord at all, and they'll find themselves eternally judged. Since Jesus is on this subject, he brings up a related topic, forgiving those who offend us. Forgiveness, another misconception. We might say, well, there are some things we can just never forgive. We might say there are some people that don't deserve forgiveness. Jesus would disagree. The community of Christ is a community of the redeemed. The church owes its very existence to the forgiveness made possible by our Savior's death. And so the duty that he lays on each of us as forgiven members of his church is to forgive the personal wrongs done against us. Or once that willingness to forgive is abandoned, then the foundation for a Christian fellowship is lost. There's no meaning to our fellowship if the forgiven are unforgiving. So how are we to go about restoring the brother or sister who sins against us? Verses 15 through 20 answer that. Let's just go through that. It was a very clear plan. First, we go to the one who sinned against us. And we go alone. Guess what? Jesus sought us while we were sinners and pursued us. We're called to do the same. Look at Luke 19 on your verse sheet. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So we seek the deliverance of those who have wandered just as the parable we just read, just as God sought that little lost sheep. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that. But here's the exciting promise. This is in God's good favor. So God's good power will go with us when we're doing what he's called us to do. So we have an opportunity to restore a friend to the Lord. He calls it gaining our brother, gaining our sister, restoring them to God. Secondly, if the person won't listen when we go to them alone, we take two or three witnesses. And this goes back to Deuteronomy 19.15, where this was part of the law. The sinner has heard Christ pleading through one, 
Now I'll hear two or three, and if they come in a spirit of gentle restoration, it's going to be a little harder for the sinning brother or sister to push against that. If the guilty party still refuses to repent, then the church must be told. But that means then all the fellowship can pursue the lost sheep with the purpose of restoring them back into the community that they were once in. The unity of the church is at stake, and unity is precious in the body of Christ. Look at Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore. But then if there is no, no, if then if there's evidence that the sinning church member may not really belong to God's kingdom, then God's community without behaving self-righteously, must view them as outside of the community of God. So the church is called to exercise authority in a believer's life. This is a privilege. It's also a duty. And in those verses when we study, it's a duty of binding and loosing, meaning recognizing what's permitted, what's not permitted in church, in the kingdom of God. Binding means bound in sin, loosing when the sinner repents from that sin. And the church can never decide these things just from someone's personal opinion. This takes prayer. This takes seeking God. And then when the church makes judgments according to God's word, the Bible tells us here, we can be sure that heaven is in accord with it. So later, Peter says to Jesus, well, how many times do we get? Forgive. Should I forgive seven times? And Peter, again, he's thinking, wow, that would be something. Because the rabbis say you have to forgive three times when someone offends you. I'll give up to seven times. And Jesus says to him, how about 70 times seven? His point is, there's no limit to the amount of forgiveness a child in the community of Christ must give. So then he told the parable of the servant who owed a king much. Today, what the servant owed the king would have been worth millions and millions of dollars. But when the servant pled for mercy before the king, the king forgave him his entire debt. And sent him on his way. So that same servant found a fellow servant who owed him what was equal to three months wages. And when the servant couldn't pay, he cruelly treated him, demanding payment, threw him in prison. But then the real king found out. Look at verse 32 in chapter 18. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus taught forgiveness must be in direct proportion to the amount forgiven. We've been forgiven everything. Everything. We must forgive everything with God's help. Look at Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We choose to forgive those who sin against us for the purpose of their restoration and to have a strong, unified church. Okay, now marriage. We all have lots of misconceptions about that. Jesus left Galilee. He entered Judea. And again, as always, these loud, large crowds followed him. And we see that he healed them again. Instead of being happy for people being healed, the Pharisees get together to try to trick Jesus. It's just amazing refusing to see what is right before them acts of God 
restoring people who have been crippled and lame and blind their entire lives. And instead, they think, how can we stop it? Let's stop this. And their thought is, let's use marriage and divorce. Will Jesus be too lax or too strict? So about marriage, some people in the world today would say marriage is a man-made institution. Some people would say it's not about commitment, it's about personal happiness. But Jesus would disagree. 19 verse 1. When Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up and tested him and said, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Haven't you read, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So they said, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Okay, so the Jewish nation was very divided about divorce. They had two schools of thought. Some Jews believed a man should be able to divorce his wife for any reason at all, like she burned the bagels at breakfast. Really, crazy things. Others said only for sexual misconduct. Instead of entering their debate, Jesus affirmed God's original intent for marriage was an unbreakable union of a man and a woman. So now the Pharisees close in on him. They think we've got him here. Will he speak against the Mosaic law? So they say this. Why then did Moses command a man to divorce his wife and send her away? Did you notice Jesus said he allowed it? They chose the word command very importantly and intentionally. Moses never commanded divorce. He permitted divorce on restricted grounds to regulate the result of man's hardened heart. He was actually with his um, principles upholding the sacredness of marriage in a community that practiced polygamy and rampant divorce. It was man that made light of marriage due to a hardened heart. So Moses directed those who were divorced in order to protect God's original intent for marriage. He was regulating a situation which would have become very promiscuous. One person said this, True, Moses permitted divorce, but that was a concession in view of a lost ideal. The ideal of marriage is to be found in the unbreakable, perfect union of Adam and Eve. That is what God meant marriage to be. And those who were listening to Jesus' words were astonished, including the disciples. Look at verse 10 in chapter 19. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said, Not everyone can receive the same, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs born from birth, there are those who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Jesus' teaching seemed overwhelming to the disciples. That's why they said, it's better off not to marry. But I love that Jesus paints a picture here that embraces those who marry and those who don't. In marriage or in singleness, verse 12 tells us, we honor God for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. We choose to pursue things that are godly to strengthen whatever relationships God has around us. Look at Ephesians 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. No matter what situation we're in, 
We choose these kinds of things. We submit to God's desire in those relationships. And then when we stray from his ideal, we seek him and we find his forgiveness. Think about how Jesus pursued the woman at the well who had five husbands. Think about how Jesus responded to the woman caught in adultery that they dropped at his feet. Jesus forgave those women and sent them forward to begin a new life under his calling. Salvation. Misconceptions about that. A young man approaches Jesus to find eternal life. Some today would say we find eternal life through our goodness. Some say we find eternal life through keeping a particular, particular ritual. But Jesus would disagree. Look at verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. He's kind of a cocky guy. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. From the other Gospels, we learn he's a rich ruler, so he's a young rich ruler. We know him as the rich young ruler. He approaches Jesus because he knows Jesus is a righteous teacher, and he thinks maybe he can answer this question that's been bothering him about eternal life. When Jesus meets this man, he looks beyond the question. And he gazes right there deep into his heart. And he sees a man who believes if he's good enough, he can earn salvation. So when the ruler calls Jesus good, Jesus first reminds him, only God is good. He was hoping the guy would get the hint there. I don't think he did. And then Jesus uses the commands of God to point out the flaws in this man's life. He goes through the commandments of God with him. Surely the ruler will recognize he hasn't been able to do all those. Jesus lists five of the six commands that are the second half of the Ten Commandments. At this point, he leaves out part of the Tenth Commandment, which is the biggest stumbling block to the ruler. The self-assured ruler thinks through the commands and says, all these I have kept. So his, spirit, his serious spiritual defect was his reluctance to confess his own spiritual bankruptcy. What still do I lack? And so Jesus exposes the heart of the rich ruler by filling in the 10th command, thou shalt not covet. Sell your possessions. Give them to the poor. Uh-oh. Jesus also brings to light that he really did neglect the command, love your neighbor as yourself or he would be generous with his things, even though he thought he had kept that command. So Jesus gives the man the opportunity to know true righteousness. Come, follow me. This is where he would find salvation. Jesus taught the young man the high standard of God and the futility to seek salvation by his own merit. And this man, who came seeking eternal life, walked away, downcast, rejecting Jesus' gracious invitation to salvation. He was unwilling to give up his self-righteousness for the righteousness that can only come through faith and following Jesus Christ. And he was unwilling to replace his riches with the riches Christ could give him. The disciples watched this man walk away. He was probably greatly esteemed because he was wealthy in the disciples' eyes. They were astonished. 
So Jesus commented, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what astonished him. They looked at each other and said, who can be saved? If wealthy people can't be saved, who can be saved? Like the Pharisees, they thought riches were a sign of God's esteem. Jesus didn't say it was impossible. He said, with God, all things are possible. And then Peter thinks and says to Jesus, you know, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? Which, of course, Peter asks this question. I love it that Jesus didn't chastise Peter here. Because they did follow him. They did give up their lives and decide to join the life of Jesus Christ. So he tells them their rewards. One day they would sit on 12 thrones next to him, judging the tribes of Israel. Because when Jesus invited them to follow him, they did. And even though we haven't seen him like the disciples, we also have those riches that transcend earthly riches. True righteousness and salvation come by faith in Jesus when we answer his call to follow me. Look at 1 Peter 1. Though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. One day we will see him. It will be astonishing. Let me pray. Jesus, you are so good. We love you. We love you that you come before us and give us this path to salvation that comes through faith in you. Just encourage us to remember this, to remember what you've given up for us, that we would give up anything that is a stumbling block to our walk that brings glory to you. Bless this church, bless everyone in this room, and we praise your name in Christ's name. Amen.